Welcome to Virology. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I am going to be your professor for this entire virology course. And this is lecture number one, what is a virus? A little bit about me before we continue. I have been working on viruses since 1976. I've been at Columbia. I'm at the medical school campus. I've been there since 1982. I have a lab that does research on viruses. I've been teaching about viruses. I've been teaching this course now. This is the 11th year. And um, I've written a textbook and done a lot of other things. It's my goal to teach you virology, to teach as many people in the world as possible all about viruses. And before this pandemic, at the beginning of every virology course, I used to say, if you want to understand all about human disease, if you want to understand human health, you need to know about viruses. And that's why I teach this course. I actually do it voluntarily. I don't have to teach at all being at a medical school, but I want you to know about viruses. And Columbia didn't have a virology course for many years. So that's why I'm doing this. It's voluntary. Nobody's forcing me to do it. But the fact is, I love viruses, even though they have caused enormous devastation in the past year. They're amazing. I'm fascinating with the, with them, and I have devoted my entire career to them. And I want to pass along to you some of my passion for viruses and make you knowledgeable more than most people on the planet. There's a lot of misinformation, and I want to fix that one student at a time. So this is my course uh, for you. We live and prosper in a cloud of viruses. Viruses infect every living thing on the planet. There is no life form that does not have some kind of a virus that infects it. In fact, most have many, many different viruses. Humans regularly eat and breathe billions of virus particles a day. You're breathing them right now. They're floating around in the air. You eat them with your food, as we'll see. And we carry viral genomes as part of our genetic material. Every life form on Earth has viral genomes as part of their genetic material. It is just remarkable. Uh, and so really, in the end, we're talking about huge, unfathomable numbers of viruses on the planet Earth. The number of viruses is staggering. And this is an example. This is just in the world's waters. People have gone out and estimated the number of bacteriophage particles in the world's waters. Bacteriophage, which is pictured here, is a virus that infects bacteria, as the name would indicate. Bacteria, archaea, everything is infected with viruses. In the world's waters, there are over 10 to the 30th bacteriophage particles. This is just remarkable. That number is too big for you to comprehend. I don't get it. I don't know what 10 to the 30th is, but we can put it in, in terms that make more sense. Next time you go in the ocean, you take a mouthful of water and spit it at someone, you're spitting millions of virus particles in coastal water, in surface water, out in the middle of the ocean, way down deep, everywhere you go, millions of virus particles per milliliter because there's a lot of life in the oceans. Now, a phage particle weighs about a femtogram, 10 to the minus 15 grams. And if you multiply that by 10 to the 30, as you find that the biomass on the planet of, of bacterial viruses alone exceeds that of elephants by a thousandfold. I mean, these are things you cannot see. That's just remarkable. And uh, if you put these phages head to tail, they would extend 100 million light years into space. That's way outside the planet formerly known, or the Pluto former planet, you know. It's just way out there. It's, it's farther than the nearest galaxy, 100 million light years. So that's a lot of viruses, and you can't see them. That's the amazing thing. And the extent to which different life forms are infected with viruses is remarkable. I'll give you some examples. Whales are commonly infected with small, naked RNA-containing viruses called calici viruses. They may cause various diseases like rashes and blisters and even gastroenteritis. Some of these viruses can infect us as well. But, but here's the thing. Infected whales excrete 
and they excrete in the feces. This is an enteric virus in whales. Over 10 to the 13th calici viruses daily. One whale, 10 to the 13th daily. It's just remarkable uh, how many, and, and many other animals are similarly infected. Perhaps one goal I have for this course is for you to understand that viruses are not just bad news. Of course, this year, everyone is going to think that's all viruses do is, is make people sick because most people have not thought about viruses before. But in fact, the vast majority are benign, maybe even considered symbiotic. So if you look in the um, ocean, and this is another great statistic, more viruses in a liter of coastal seawater than there are people on Earth. That's how many viruses are in the oceans. If you look at these two pie charts here, the one on the left is looking at um, prokaryotes, protists, and viruses. Right? So protists are eukaryotes and then virus particles by biomass alone. And, and prokaryotes uh, vastly outmass out the others. There's more, more mass of uh, prokaryotes in the ocean than protists or viruses. But if you look at particle number or abundance, viruses make up 94% of all particles in the ocean of, among these three groups. They are in the oceans, you may be wondering, what are they doing? Are they just infecting bacteria, protists, and fish and mammals that live in the ocean? Well, they are, but they're not making most of them sick, actually. They are catalysts for biogeochemical cycling. They turn over carbon and sulfur and phosphorus. Without viruses releasing organic matter, uh, the earth would be uh, quite a bad place to live. And we're just beginning to understand this. So they have huge roles in cycles uh, on the earth. Another interesting statistic today, there are 10 to the six genomes of HIV-1 on the planet, human immunodeficiency. We have another pandemic going on right now. And it's amazing, most people don't realize that. It's the HIV AIDS pandemic. There are 37 million people infected at the moment. And we'll have an entire lecture on HIV AIDS to emphasize that. But we know how many genomes are in each person. And we can calculate 10 to the 16, also a huge number. And what does it mean? Well, among those genomes, because the viral genome is so variable as most RNA genomes are, there already exists resistance to every antiviral drug we have. We have well over 30 antiviral drugs to treat HIV AIDS that work very well but there's already resistance to all of them out there. And no matter how many we make in the future, um, we will have resistance to them because of this genetic diversity. That's what that means, a number like that. What about us? How infected are we? Well, we at least have, and all of you have these viruses, about a dozen herpes viruses in us, like herpes simplex one and two, varicella zoster, human cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, and then herpes, human herpes virus 6, 7, and 8. You all get these in your first decade of life, and you have them for the rest of your life. There's no exception, and you can't get rid of them. Once infected, it's for life. I love to say, unlike love, herpes is forever, because many of these you get from loving. And I get an email on a daily basis, I get posting on my social media, Dr. So-and-so cured me of herpes. No, it's not possible. Not today. Maybe in the future we could do that. But these are with you for life, and we're going to have a lecture that explains that. However, we have more than just a dozen herpes viruses. As you know, we have a microbiome that is unique to each part of our body. We have microbes in our mouth, in our respiratory system, in our skin, in our intestines, and so forth that have just been characterized in the last 15 years and which are clearly beneficial for us. And if we disturb the populations, we have problems. And many diseases are being linked to the microbiome and the products that they make, the metabolic products that they make. But we also have a virome. And here on the left is a a diagram of what we know of the human virome. Again, every tissue and organ system has its unique complement of viruses. And here they're coded whether they're DNA or RNA containing viruses in blue or green by pie charts. 
you can, and your skin, your digestive tract, your blood, etc. Even your nervous system has viruses. Just think of this. There are viruses in all parts of your body. Most of them are not making you sick. We think that most of them are actually beneficial. Now, in recent years, we've developed technologies that allow us to study the microbiome and the virome. Of course, sequencing is a big part of that. But here on the right is a movie, which I'm going to play for you. And this is a drone. And on the top of the drone is a, a, a big Petri dish, a plastic Petri dish. And this drone is being flown by scientists on a, on a nearby boat. This is off the coast of Australia. And these are whales here. You can see the, the blow coming out of these whales. And they want to collect the breath of these whales and see what viruses are in it. So what they do is when they fly over the whale, they this there's a little mechanism that opens it. So let's play it. There you go. See the lid came up and then it, so it came up, it caught the mist from the whale breath, closes, then they go back, they bring it back to land and they can sequence and find out what viruses are, are in whale breath. You couldn't do that before. You can't catch a whale. As I sit still while I sample your anterior nares, <laughs> it doesn't work. This is brilliant. A combination of sequencing, of course, which you need to do this and also the drone technology. So we can access a lot of different kinds of wildlife that way. As I said earlier, our genome contains viral information integrated in it. So here's a pie chart of the human genome, 3.2 billion bases. Of course, it's been sequenced many times in many, many humans. And it's divided according to what we've found. And, you know, it's just embarrassing how little is protein coding genes, 1.5%. The rest is non-coding and has various functions. And what I want to point out to you here, these LTR retrotransposons, uh, these are, in some of these are in fact uh, remnants of viral infections, retrovirus infections, whose feature of their reproductive cycle is to integrate their nucleic acid into our genome. And these other signs, short interspersed nuclear elements and long interspersed nuclear elements are also retro elements that can move around the genome. And these, these are beneficial. They can also harm us. Uh, but we have taken some of these viral genes and used them in the course of our evolution. And we'll talk about that in this course. In fact, the placenta would not be here if we didn't have a retrovirus that delivered the syncytion gene that's needed for the formation of the placenta. Of course, most people are interested in viruses because they cause disease. So here is a cause, a, a chart showing you the causes of 2017 global deaths. This is the most recent data I can find. And by different causes here, and you can see, of course, cardiovascular diseases are the biggest killer, cancers. Uh, and I've put arrows next to the viral diseases, of course, lower respiratory infections. You can see diarrheal diseases have a lot of viral causes. And then where does COVID-19 fit? Well, so we have about 1.9 million deaths so far as of January 4th. And uh, that would put it, you know, just between digestive and neonatal disorders. That's a pandemic that's been going for about a year. It's quite remarkable. We'll certainly have more than, far more than that by the time this is over. HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, many hepatitis uh, infections are caused by infections. So we try to avert some of this, of course, by studying viruses and uh, learning how to prevent or resolve uh, infections. So let's take a look now at the current numbers. I'm going to switch to a live version of this. Uh, so when I started teaching this course, the Johns Hopkins site, which all of you certainly know, didn't exist. And I have some screen caps where the global cases, now 90 million plus global cases, this was 5,000, 10,000, 30,000. And I remember most of the red dots were in China for, for many, many weeks and, and nowhere else. And then they slowly started spreading. So this is a wonderful uh, website where you can go to learn the numbers, the cases, the global deaths. You can drill down by country, as you can see. And of course, we're leading... Yeah, in cases and in deaths. 
because we have had a really poor response to the pandemic. We'll talk more about that later. Anyway, that's a great site. There's also a wonderful site in the New York Times where they show you um, cases in the U.S. from uh, March until the present. And they also have a map of the country where they, you know, the red, the, where's the here, the, the redder areas, the darker areas have more cases. And then uh, they also have a worldview. So we don't get to U.S. centric latest maps and data. That's the worldview. And they have a map of the world with the heat map of cases as well. So lots of great um, resources to study this. Well, this is not a course about the pandemic, but you're going to learn virology and you're going to understand what's going on in the pandemic. The vast majority of viruses that infect us, as opposed to this one SARS-CoV-2 that's been killing so many people, most of the others have no impact on our health or well-being. And why is that? Why is that? Uh, and, you know, someone asked in the chat, why is it that people can have symptoms associated with herpes if we all had it? So that's an interesting characteristic of that infection because it goes into latent phases where it's silent and then it reactivates periodically and then you may or may not have disease. We'll have an entire lecture on that in this course. Well, many viruses just pass through us. You eat them, for example, in your food. And uh, here's a two interesting studies. In one, they looked at cabbage from five different supermarkets in Washington, D.C. And, you know, cabbage is used to make coleslaw, of course. And each serving would have up to 10 to the eighth particles of a virus that infects the cabbage looper. This is a cabbage looper right here on the right, caterpillar of cabbage. So these caterpillars are crawling over the cabbage and they're shedding viruses. You can't wash them off. You can't. You just can't get them off. And it doesn't matter because they pass right through you. They cannot infect your cells. And we'll study Ooh. why in that course, why they cannot infect your cells. Here's another example. Uh, if you take human feces and you sequence the nucleic acid, most of the RNA virus sequences, 91% of the RNA in human feces is similar to plant viruses. So we eat a lot of plants. They have their own viruses. We have them in our feces. They just pass through. They don't infect us. You know, you can have your fecal virome done now. You can send feces to a company and they'll sequence the virome. And I routinely get emails from people, have this plant virus, is it bad? Is it a problem? No, it's not a problem. They're just going to pass through you. The most abundant human fecal virus is pepper mild model virus. It's a virus of peppers. It makes peppers look bad. And it's a long, flexuous virus, as you can see here. But it's completely harmless to us. 10 to the ninth virus particles per gram of feces, but they don't infect us. So most viruses just pass through us, and that's just the GI tract, but same for the respiratory tract, your skin. Uh, we are regularly encountering viruses that simply cannot infect us. As I said earlier, I think many viruses are in fact beneficial. Not all of them just pass through us. Many of them reproduce in us, but they don't cause disease. And I suspect that some of them are beneficial. It's hard to, look, to study that, though. We can't do the experiments in people that we need to know to do that. But here are two examples of beneficial viruses in systems that you can study. On the left is a plant uh, called Dicanthelium lanuginosum. Sounds like a Harry Potter curse, right? This is a plant that grows at high temperatures. If you go to Yellowstone National Park with all the hot springs, these grasses will grow right next to them. 55 degrees Celsius, no problem. And they're able to grow because they have inside them a fungus with a virus in the fungus. Because if you take the virus out of the fungus, the plant will not grow at high temperature. Uh, and so you need both, the virus and the fungus for, for growing at high temperature. So the fungus has a place to live. The virus gets to grow in the fungus and the, and the grass grows at high temperatures. That's an example of beneficial viruses. But we can manipulate this in the lab and, and find out you know, and we can't manipulate people to take out their viruses and see what happens. Here on the right is another amazing one. There are lots of examples of this, but this is a wasp, a parasitoid wasp that lays its eggs inside of an insect larva, like a caterpillar. And the eggs then will hatch into baby wasps who then eat their way out of the larva. And um, what was that movie? Uh, Aliens, right? They didn't invent anything. It was already in nature. 
the wasp genome has encoded in it viral genes to make virus particles. And so when the wasp delivers an egg into the caterpillar, it also delivers virus particles. These blue dots here, it's a polydna virus. It's a big DNA virus. And the virus delivers genes whose gene products immunosuppress the caterpillar so it won't reject the wasp egg. So this virus is good for the wasp, of course, not so good for the caterpillar because it allows the wasp eggs to hatch and eventually not be rejected. There are all kinds of examples of this, of how viruses manipulate different hosts uh, to benefit one or the other. <clears throat> now, there is some evidence in mammals that viruses are beneficial. For example, uh, this is an example of mice uh, whose, whose enteric tracts uh, develop properly because of a, a norovirus. A norovirus is related to those viruses of whales that I told you about earlier. So it turns out this is these are sections of the intestinal tract of mice. You can see the villi, right? <clears throat> if you might, if you grow uh, mice in a germ-free facility, that is without bacteria, their intestinal tract is aberrant. So the villi are morphologically aberrant in the control. The conventional mice are here. This is the control of mice that have the normal complement of bacteria. So they're morphologically aberrant and their immune system isn't properly developed. Here on the bottom, we're staining for uh, CD3 cells, which are lymphocytes. And you can see the normal mice have the brown staining cells. Those are the immune cells in the Germ-free mice don't. So there's a defect in the morphology of the gut and in the number of immune cells if you grow mice without bacteria. You can infect these mice with a murine norovirus and partially restore all of this. So here you have now lymphocytes returning uh, to the villi and the morphology is a little better. It's not completely normal, but it's just one virus. If you infect these mice, and this is a murine virus, it partially restores the functions that are lost when you take away the, the bacteria. I, I just think this is amazing. Now, what about in people? We don't have any data because we haven't been able to study. We can't take away viruses in, in a similar way. Although one day when we have broadly acting antivirals, we may be able to find out. The other reason why many viruses don't hurt us is we have an amazing immune system. So all those herpes viruses that are in you, they're kept in check most of the time by your immune system. Many other viruses that infect us are also controlled by this immune system, which we'll explore very briefly in this course, two lectures or so. Uh, but uh, we'll explore the interactions of this system with viruses. And to emphasize how amazing this immune system is, when your immune system is down, if you're immunosuppressed, for example, if you are on drugs to take care of a cancer, they can immunosuppress you. Many virus infections can immunosuppress you. HIV, AIDS, measles virus, and others. And then you have problems. And if you take immunosuppressive therapy, for example, for various diseases, all these viruses that are in us can be a problem. And so liver transplants, when you get a liver you get immunosuppressive drugs, and then human cytomegalovirus begins to reproduce and cause problems. You have it in you, we all do, and normally it's kept in check, but if you're immunosuppressed, then the viruses can cause pathology. So viruses not only pass through us, they reproduce in us, they're kept in check by our immune system, and there are many that reproduce in us but don't make us sick. And we'll explore some of these later. Here's a polyomavirus, a small DNA containing viruses that infect everyone. Over 90% of the planet is seropositive. And there's slightly different kinds of polyomaviruses. You get these in your family. They're spread within your family. And so as your first 10 years of life, you get it from your parents uh, and siblings. And we can trace population movements by what kinds of polyomaviruses they have been infected with. So here's a map of a human population movement. The dotted purple line is reconstructed by genetic analysis of populations, human populations. So humans moving out of Africa uh, into Europe and Asia and eventually into the Americas, right? The black line is reconstructing human movements based on polyomavirus infections. Much more granular, as you can see, you can even see moving into Australia. These are viruses that don't hurt you, again, unless you're immunosuppressed. 
Now, in a bigger picture, viruses clearly shape host populations and vice versa. So when a virus is introduced into a population, as you have seen last year with SARS-CoV-2, it kills a lot of people. It can shape the population. And, and similarly, if a virus doesn't have a host, if the host is gone, if the host becomes extinct, there's no more of that virus. So it's a two-way street. And here's an example, which I love because this is a uh, example of a virus that infects these uh, uh, eukaryotic phytoplankton that bloom in the ocean. And you can see them from space. This is a satellite photograph of one of these blooms. The organism is Emiliana huxleyi. And these blooms get big and then viruses infect them and then the blooms go away. The blooms are collapsed. So that's an example of how a virus can affect a population. There are many, many examples and we'll, we'll explore some of those uh, later on uh, in evolution. So in short, viruses are amazing. You, you've just never seen anything like it. You're going to love this course. You're going to love what you learn. You're going to be amazed. But what I want to leave you with just before we go into some detail is that virology is an integrative science. What do I mean by that? You need to know everything to understand viruses. You, there's, just, there's no subject just of virology. Virology, to understand viruses, you have to know cell biology, biochemistry, uh, physiology, even ecology, even sociology to see how populations interact, epidemiology, and many more. So that's what I mean by integrative. It brings together all these different disciplines. And I've had many students tell me, you know, I took biology as a freshman. Most of it didn't make sense. But in the context of viruses, now it all makes sense. That's the beauty of virology, because you need to understand all about how cells work to understand virology. And my goals for this course are shown here. I want to teach you the big picture. This course is not about individual viruses. You can find lots of virology courses where lecture one is influenza virus, lecture two is herpes, lecture three is coronavirus. You're not going to learn virology that way. That's why our textbook is written by principle. We take a core set of viruses and we teach you how viruses work, how they cause disease. And that's what we're going to do in this course. This, this course is designed around the textbook. So I want you to learn about virology as an integrated discipline. I'm not going to teach you about viruses. I'm not going to teach you about diseases or genes. We're going to put the whole picture together. And in the end, you're going to have a better understanding. And then you could take an advanced course where you delve into specific viruses. And perhaps the most important one in these days of misinformation, you're going to learn things that I say amaze the informed and frighten the uninformed. People typically are afraid when they don't understand something. And in this pandemic, we've seen so many examples of how, how people want to blame others, for example, for the origin of the virus. They want to blame a lab in China, which you'll see is just absurd. It reflects a lack of understanding of virology. And I want to teach you that. But even more important, I want you to be able to read a newspaper headline and understand when it's right and when it's wrong. And my, my interaction with mainstream media over the years, and it's not just this year, has always been tempestuous because at least the people who write the headlines need to take a virology course. So here are some examples. This actually are some headlines from last year, but every time there's an outbreak, it's the same. Coronavirus could mutate. Coronavirus could mutate. And here the vice minister in China, um, there is the possibility of viral mutation. And then just uh, recently in the New York Times, the coronavirus is mutating. You will learn in this course why these headlines drive me crazy. The virus is always mutating. Always at every reproduction cycle in every cell in your body that's infected. It's always mutating. The question is, whether it means anything. So these headlines are crazy. And I want you to learn how to distinguish truth from not truth in, in virology reporting. We are going to uh, do these quizzes throughout 
the lectures so that you get a break from listening to me and I can see if I've been teaching you. So what you have to do is go to this website and it will ask you for a room number. And the room number is virus, of course. And here and go there now and, and take this quiz, which statement is true. Uh, all viruses make us sick and can be lethal. Our immune system can manage most infections. Humans are usually infected with one virus at a time. The press is usually correct in their virology reporting. Our immune system cannot handle most viral infections. Looks like most people uh, got selected B, which is our immune hand system can handle most infections. That's correct. All viruses make us sick and lethal isn't correct. Uh, we are infected with one virus at a time, of course, is not correct. The press is usually not correct. Well, that's probably harsh, but you can see why that would be false. And our immune system can handle uh, most virus infections. What is a virus? That's the name of this lecture, so let's define it. Here's my definition, which has changed over the years. An infectious obligate intracellular parasite comprising genetic material, and that can be DNA or RNA, often surrounded by a protein coat and sometimes a membrane. So let's let's break it down. And infectious, that, that's clear. Infectious means it can go from cell to cell or host to host. Obligate intracellular parasite. So obligate intracellular means the virus has to get into a cell in order to reproduce. If it doesn't get in a cell, that's the end of that virus. It needs to get inside. And parasite, of course, means one organism taking something from another. So viruses can take your life or they can take materials that they need even in order to reproduce. It can be very subtle or it can be very dramatic. Genetic material, DNA or RNA. Viruses are unusual because some viruses have RNA and there's nothing else on the planet that has RNA as its genetic material. We have DNA, everybody else has DNA. There are some viruses that have RNA like SARS-CoV-2. And of course, that is because probably the first life molecules that evolved on Earth were RNA molecules and the first life forms were RNA-based. So viruses, RNA viruses are relics of what we call an RNA world. And we'll talk more about that later. And these genomes can be surrounded by a protein coat. So here, for example, um, is poliovirus, the virus I've spent my entire career working on. It's just a piece of RNA with a protein shell. Here's adenovirus, which is being used to make some of the vaccines being used as a vector. And it's again, DNA with a protein shell. And sometimes there's a membrane. So let's go right to coronaviruses here. It's an RNA virus with a membrane. And in that membrane, of course, are spike glycoproteins and other kinds of glycoproteins. Here's influenza virus, again, a membrane with spikes in the membrane. So that's the fundamental structure. And that's the fundamental definition. We'll look into how these viruses are built in a subsequent lecture. So viruses are obligate molecular parasites. They need the machinery of the host cell. So when you study a virus and you learn about it, you learn about the cell. And countless cellular processes have been understood by studying viruses. Almost every major cellular pathway, for example, DNA synthesis was first figured out using a virus. The structure of messenger RNA was figured out using viruses. Splicing of messenger RNA was discovered with viruses. They're amazing systems for studying the host cell. Now, a very interesting question that many people have, and they're very opinionated about, is are viruses alive? And I used to have a, a poll on my blog. It's not there anymore. But um, are viruses alive? And you can see it's evenly split between yes and no and something in between. But I, over the years, have thought a lot about this, and there's quite a straightforward answer. And it really depends on what you mean by virus. So let me explain. A virus is an organism with two phases. There's the virus particle, which you all think of when you think of virus, right? The pictures of the coronaviruses and all the viruses I've just shown you. That's the virus particle. There's no way that that can be alive. It's a piece of nucleic acid surrounded by protein and sometimes a membrane. Can't do anything. It cannot reproduce on its own. However, when it infects a cell, it actually reprograms the cell to make more virus particles. 
And so the cell, of course, the infected cell is clearly living, but the virus particle is not. So this solves the conundrum. When you say virus, what you are meaning is an organism with two phases. There's the infectious particle, which is not living, and there's the infected cell, which is clearly alive, and it's dedicated to making virus particles. And so, you know, many people say, oh, the viruses have the potential to be alive. Yes, when they infect the cell, but the particle is not. It just cannot be. The other thing I want to warn you about, and will probably remind you multiple times, is to avoid anthropomorphic analyses. Now, science journalists love to use these because it makes it easier to explain science, but viruses do not have human qualities. They do not think, they do not employ, ensure, exhibit, display, they don't do any of those active words. They are passive agents. Everything that happens is a passive activity. A virus bumps into a cell, and if it happens to have a receptor, the virus binds and then gets in. There's no active part of it. And so they do not achieve their goals in a human-centric manner. The danger with saying viruses are thinking about doing this is that you apply human values to what viruses are doing, and we have no idea if that's correct. You know, saying the virus wants to become more transmissible is absolutely wrong. It doesn't have any desires. But if you apply your human sensibility to virology, you're going to misunderstand what happens. And so that's the key here. It's more than just semantics. It's a matter of whether you view viral processes on their own as they should be or through a human lens, which is not correct. And again, there are many examples of this happening in, in the popular literature. The other part of the definition uh, that used to be part of the definition of viruses is that they were small, but I've taken that out because many of them, in fact, are small, but many of them are, are pretty big, uh, as we've discovered recently. So here, just to give you a sense of scale, here's an E. coli at 100,000 X, and there's a bacteriophage uh, of E. coli attached to it. Uh, next to the phage, this rod-like structure, that's a, a tobacco mosaic virus. It's a virus of tobacco. So they're, they're much smaller than the E. coli, of course, but, you know, comparable scale. And then D is actually HIV-1, so it's quite large. And then A is a panel, which is expanded on the right a millionfold. And here is a, a polio virus, H. And a, G is a ribosome. So the poliovirus and ribosomes are, are very similar in size. And there's a tRNA, an antibody molecule. So a is supposed to be a carbon atom, but of course it should be much smaller. And here are some uh, you know, actin and myosin cables and some, some enzymes. So viruses can range from the very small. You, think you can't see these with a the naked eye. And, and in fact, here's a, a diagram that shows that in a more clarity. So here's a, a scale size going from a centimeter to an angstrom, which is, you know, 10 to the minus 10th meters. And we have atoms down there all the way through cells. And viruses are somewhere in between bacteria and ribosomes in their scale. And depending on what you're studying, you know, we can use a light microscope. Light microscope doesn't work for most viruses. You have to use an electron microscope or cryo-electron microscopy. And of course, for proteins and atoms, we need X-ray uh, crystallography and NMR, and we'll see how we use these technologies to study virus particles. But here is a cell, again, to show you scale, a eukaryotic cell with a nucleus, and coming out of it are herpes viruses and polioviruses. So here this area is expanded. There's a herpes virus about 200 nanometers in diameter, and the, the poliovirus about 30 nanometers, about 10 times smaller and ribosomes about 20 nanometers. So I want you to get used to these size measurements because I'll be using these terms, nanometers, quite often uh, throughout this course. And of course, you're all wanting to know how many viruses can fit on the head of a pin, and here's the answer. So a pin is about two millimeters in diameter, and that is a dust mite right there in pink. That's a hair lying across the top of the pin. And the in the middle is something, but you can't quite see it, and that's expanded on the right. And here we have some pollen and some lymphocytes. These are red blood cells. These are bacteria in green. 
And then uh, right in the middle, there are some virus particles. The, the biggest one is actually Ebola virus and the others you can't even see. But uh, you can put 500 million rhinoviruses. Rhinoviruses are the common cold viruses. They're about the same size as polio virus. 500 million rhinoviruses on the head of a pin. And when you sneeze, the droplets that you expel can be larger than the head of a pin. So you have enormous capacity to expel lots of viruses to infect other people. And that's how viruses are transmitted, of course, in part, and why they are so effective. And we'll talk about those later. Now, viruses, as I said, in the definition of viruses, we used to say small obligate intracellular. We took small out because we have now discovered huge viruses. And here's one. Mimi virus was the first giant virus discovered. That's what we call them, giant viruses. And for comparison, rhinovirus there, 30 nanometers. You can see this is, this is about 700 nanometers in diameter. HIV, bigger than rhinovirus, but dwarfed by Mimi. And here's an electron micrograph of, of two Mimi viruses uh, in an infected cell. Even bigger viruses have been since discovered. Um, here is one called Pandora virus because uh, its genome is so huge. It's like opening a pan. Actually, the Pandora was not a box. Actually, it was a, it was a um, flask of some kind, and this was flask-liked. But this is a big DNA virus that infects am amoeba, and this is a light Pho microscopy photograph of um, Pandora virus particles. They're about a thousand nanometers in length. You can see them under a light microscope. Not very, not many viruses can be visible in a light microscope. This is huge. The genome is is huge as well. And here's a graph of virus particle size versus genome size to emphasize this. Here's a polyomavirus, which we talked about quite small. Herpes virus is 200 nanometers. And the vaccinia virus or smallpox virus relative is even bigger. And then we have our Mimi virus here, uh, about 700 nanometers. And you can see there's our Pandora virus. And even bigger viruses have been found, pithovirus, 1,500 uh, nanometers in length with huge genomes. So small is out of the definition of virus particles. Now, a key property of how viruses work is they replicate by assembly of preformed components. You make the parts, you assemble the virus particle. It's very different from bacteria, which of course reproduce by binary fission. You put a bacterium, a single bacterium in a broth and it begins to double. From one you have two and four and eight and so forth, binary fission. Viruses don't do that. When you put viruses into cells for a while, you don't see anything because during this eclipse period, the parts are being made, then they're assembled, and you then begin to see the infectious particles made. This was a key differentiator from early scientists who were studying viruses, how they were different from bacteria. Which of the following is true concerning bacterial versus viral replication? Viruses must assemble using preformed components. Bacteria do not replicate via binary fission as viruses do. Bacteria must assemble using preformed components. Viruses do not have an eclipse period. Viruses replicate by binary fission. Someone asked in the chat, why does it, did it take longer to find huge viruses? <laughs> One would think smaller ones would be harder to find. You know, it's a good question. They were only discovered 15 years ago. All of them infect amoeba, and nobody was looking for amoeba viruses. And I have to say that first Mimi virus was first seen in a, in a specimen and they thought it was a bacteria. So they put it in the freezer and forgot it for 10 years because it was too big. People weren't thinking about such big viruses. And now we show the results. There we go. That's what I was looking for before. The, the right answer, which most of you got is A, my viruses must assemble using preformed components. The others are all wrong. Bacteria do not replicate by binary fission. Of course they do replicate by binary fission. Bacteria don't assemble using preformed components. And viruses do not have an eclipse. They do. They have a period where you can't see any new virus particles. How old are viruses? In, in this one study, a virus... So now what we can do is we can sequence viral genomes and we can estimate how old they are by a variety of techniques that we'll talk about later. And uh, in one study, 
some retroviruses were suggested to have arisen 450 million years ago in the Ordovician period, which is right here on the timeline of, uh, of, of life, right? First land plants arising. So these arose in the oceans first 450 million years ago when organisms like this one were swimming around. But that's only because we have some data that suggests that. I think these viruses originated before cells. They were pieces of RNA just replicating in the primordial soup. And they were precursors of cells, actually. And we'll talk more about that in detail. So probably they've been around for billions of years. Although, you know, before cells is a very different thing than we think about now. I think viruses arose as self-replicating nucleic acids. From then arose cells. And then the viruses went into the cells because it was easier to reproduce in the cells than outside of cells. But we fast forward many, many billions of years. We can see some ancient references to viral diseases. This, this uh, amphora from 700 BC says on it here, this firebrand rabid hector. So rabid referring to rabies, which was a disease that occurred and was not known to be caused by a virus, of course. And then this is a Egyptian carving from 1500 years BC. And this priest has a dropped foot, which is characteristic of polio. The leg becomes paralyzed and you can't hold the foot up any longer because you need muscles to do that. So it drops. It's flaccid paralysis. It's typical of poliomyelitis. In the 1700s, or actually the 11th century, in China, they practice a method called variolation. So by this time, there were many diseases known. How they developed was not known, but they were known to be contagious. And so, for example, smallpox was already known uh, in the 11th century. And it was known that some people who recovered from smallpox never got it again. So they did this practice where they would take some smallpox pustules and inoculate them into people to immunize them. We would call that today. It was called variolation. And here you have an example of the, the pustule actually being blown into the nose of a person because this uh, smallpox is acquired by respiratory inhalation. Now, about 30% of these individuals would die. So not a great vaccine by today's standards, but it did protect some of the population. In the 1700s, uh, the wife of the British ambassador to Turkey noticed this process or this practice in Turkey. She brought it back to the UK and it spread uh, throughout the UK. And this was all without knowing what the agent was, but simply that the survivors were protected. And finally, in the 1790s, experiments by Edward Jenner in England established vaccination. And from then on is history. And we'll talk about that in our vaccine lecture. But when did the concept of microorganisms and viruses arise? This is very interesting history. It begins with three individuals at different times, Leeuwenhoek, Pasteur, and Koch. And Leeuwenhoek, of course, uh, developed a microscope. And, you know, people used to think whatever you could see, that was all there was on the earth. And Leuvenhoek said, no, there's stuff in water. There's all kinds of small things swimming around. The concept of microorganisms, something smaller than what we see, and what you need a microscope to see. Pasteur then, in the 1800s, developed this idea that there are bacteria, microscopic bacteria that can reproduce that they do not arise by spontaneous generation. His famous swan-necked broth experiment where he sterilized broth and showed it remained sterile until you uh, broke the neck of this flask. Uh, and the bacteria could be used to make good things like wine and beer and cheese. So that's Pasteur. Microorganisms. And then Koch, working in Germany, said, you know, these bacteria, not just for wine and cheese, they can make you sick. So he developed the germ theory of disease. He said some bacteria can cause diseases. However, no, no viruses yet. The technology isn't good enough. So what, when did we learn about viruses? Well, if you look in the literature, as early as 1728, the virus was used to describe an agent that causes infectious disease. And virus comes from the Latin word meaning poison. So they're thought to be liquids know that they were particulate. And Pasteur has said, every virus is a microbe. So he thought the things causing disease are microbes, my bacteria, for example, that are growing, okay? 
a key event in the evolution of viruses is, is a, an apparatus made by Chamberlain who worked with Pasteur and he developed this porcelain filter to sterilize water. Water in those days was horribly contaminated. You could just uh, apply a vacuum to this filter, pour the water in, it would go through the porcelain and it would sterilize it. It removed bacteria. And Pasteur found, he was working on rabies agent. He, he found that the, the agent of rabies passed through these filters. It's pretty small. So he said, ah, it's a small bacterium. Okay. Then at the end of the 1800s, uh, people are already smoking. Tobacco is a big industry. And uh, it turns out that some of the tobacco can get diseases. This is called tobacco mosaic. The leaves become blotched. And you can't sell the tobacco. It doesn't make good cigar or cigarette. So a lot of people were working on figuring out what was causing it. So what they would do is grind up the leaves, pass them through Chamberlain's filter, and see where the agent was. And two different individuals in 1892 and 1898 found that something that passed through this filter could cause tobacco mosaic disease. And remember, the filter retains bacteria. And so this something really small is going through it. And today we have similar filters that you can buy and use in the laboratory. They're 0.2 micron filters that retain bacteria but let viruses pass through them. First animal virus was discovered in 1898. Again, the agent of foot and mouth disease, a virus that causes infection of cattle, is filterable. It passes through the filter that would retain bacteria. So the key concept here is that the agent is small, but also these agents don't replicate in broth. You have to put them in a host, either a tobacco leaf or a cow. They will not reproduce in broth. And again, the filter size was 0.2 micron, but they were still thought to be liquids at this point. That's why they were going through the filter. And after that point, lots of new viruses were discovered. The first human virus, yellow fever, rabies, smallpox, polio and chicken leukemia, all the way through 1933, where we first identified influenza virus, well after the first, that, that big 1918 uh, pandemic. And so these are all called filterable viruses, the idea that they can pass through a filter. And we didn't know that they were particulate. And the, the, the pace of discovery is shown here. Uh, once Koch showed how to grow bacteria, the pace of bacterial discovery grows really quickly. Uh, viruses in red, filterable viruses, they were still called. Here's the discovery of TMV, and then many, many more uh, were discovered. But in 1939, the key experiment is done by Helmut Ruska. He built the first electron microscope in Germany in 1933, and he took the first electron micrographs of bacteriophage. He said, what is this filterable virus? Let's take a look at it. And he did, and he saw there were particles. They're not liquids. So 1939, well after influenza virus is discovered, we finally drop filterable from the name, and now they're viruses, they're particulate agents. Okay, last question here. Which is a key concept first discovered about viruses that distinguish them from other microorganisms? Too large to pass through a 0.2 micron filter, uh, replicate only in broth. They made tobacco plants sick. They were small enough to pass through a 0.2 micron filter or none of the above. So most of you got D, they were small enough to pass through a 0.2 micron filter. That was the first key concept, not too large. Uh, they don't replicate in broth, of course. They do make tobacco plants sick, but so do bac bacteria could do that as well. So that's not a key concept. So in 1939, this experiment was done, which I've already showed you, and that proved that viruses were not simply small bacteria. So it's the same time as the EM was done that I showed you. And they did a growth curve. So if, again, if you put bacteria in broth, they begin to divide immediately because they simply divide by binary fission. If you put a virus onto cells, remember, if you put a virus in broth, nothing will happen. But if you infect cells, there's an eclipse period during which you don't see any new viruses made. And what's happening there is the parts are being made and then they're assembled and then you get virus infectivity. We'll, we'll discuss this growth curve. That's what it's called next time in more detail. So that showed that viruses were not simply small bacteria because they had this eclipse period. They didn't divide by binary fission, a really different way of reproducing. 
And as time went on, we begin to have pictures, electron micrographs of more viruses, bacteriophage, tobacco mosaic virus there and B, the rod-like particle, rabies virus, bullet-shaped, uh, and round viruses. Today, we know incredible details about viruses. We have three-dimensional structures of many viruses, like poliovirus shown here. We even know the chemical formula for poliovirus because we know every atom, every atom of RNA and protein in the virus particle. And we classify viruses, and you'll encounter this throughout this course. And you've already heard it when you say someone, say SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. What does that mean to be a coronavirus? Well, when we find a new virus, we classify it, and mostly by the sequence of the nucleic acid. And as you'll see, back in January last year, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was identified. The genome was sequenced, and immediately it told us it was a coronavirus by homology with other coronaviruses. But other properties that are important, the kind of shell it has, the, whether or not there's an envelope, uh, and the dimensions of the virus particle. This top one, the sequence of the nucleic acids, only been possible in the last 40 years as sequencing has emerged. And before that, it was the other properties that we used. And we use a very formal hierarchical system of classifying viruses, very much like uh, other organisms, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and so forth. And there's actually more granularity, but uh, you don't need to know that. There's a website that keeps all the classification in order. And mainly in this course, we'll be talking about families like the Filoviridae family or the Coronaviridae family. These are families of genera of viruses. Uh, and within them, we have species. Now, technically, viruses don't exist as species because the species definition means two organisms that cannot produce offspring. Um, but uh, we use it as is a simply a classification mechanism. And virus discovery, which was once driven only by disease, all of those early viruses that I showed you, yellow fever, poliovirus, smallpox, they were all driven by saying, oh, there's a new disease. Let's find out what's causing it. And they found viruses. Nowadays, we just look for viruses by genome sequencing. And here's a fascinating study uh, published a couple of years ago where investigators collected a variety of insects, crustaceans, nematodes, mollusks, small critters, I would say, and they extracted the nucleic acid and sequenced them, and they found 1,445 new viruses from 220 invertebrate species. And this is what we do now. We simply extract nucleic acid, and we look for viruses, and we find them by the score. We find thousands just, just doing a study like this you can find thousands of new viruses. And this has hardly been done for any species, like rodents. We hardly know what's in rodents. And they're a threat to humans because any animal that lives in large numbers and close to humans is a threat for a pandemic spillover. Now, you may say, why do we care about sequencing all the viruses out there? And that's really our goal. We want to know everything that's out there. Well, viruses are the greatest biodiversity on the planet. They outnumber cellular life by 10 to 1. There are more virus genes than anything else. We got to know that. There's just no way we can ignore it. As I said just briefly, they drive global biogeochemical cycles. They make the earth work. They're the reason why carbon uh, is released in the ocean because of viruses. They shape host populations and the host-shaped virus populations. We'll see evidence of that throughout this course. Um, we suspect that many of them are beneficial. We can see that in other host systems and probably also in humans as well. And of course, they are the sources of new pathogens. Obviously, bats are a source of the coronavirus that has caused the pandemic for the past year. We don't really know what's in bats for the most part. We've hardly sampled them, mainly in China, but many other countries have bats. They have coronaviruses. We need to know what's in them. And next from bats are rodents, which also are numerous and live close to humans. I would say any mammal is likely to harbor viruses that can be a threat to us. And we, we don't do enough studying to uh, understand what's out there. Now you can see that the viral world is huge, but we can order it. And that's one of my goals in this course 
there's an underlying simplicity to viruses because of two very simple facts. First, the genome is a molecular parasite. It will only function in a cell. And so we can see what it needs from the cell and that can help us to, to clarify how it works. And then all viruses have to make messenger RNA that the host translates. No virus encodes a translation system. Every virus on the planet has to be translated. Its mRNA has to be translated by the host translation system. So the mRNA must be compatible with the host cell. So we can use these two features to organize all of the viruses out there, the millions and millions of different kinds of viruses into a scheme that makes sense and makes it easier for us to study them. And we'll start doing that uh, in the next couple of lectures. Uh, now, someone asked how many viruses were discovered in the cave you recently talked about on TWIV. Well, the, the, the cave, the, you may be talking about the cave full of bats. You know, the caves can have millions of bats in them. And if you sample, the, the easiest way to sample bats is to go in the cave. You should be gowned up to protect yourself. You can collect the guano, the bat poop that's on the floor of the cave and bring it back and sequence it. And you can find thousands and thousands of viruses, but it's barely been done uh, anywhere. And you know, one thing that's quite interesting is that many farmers in parts of the world collect bat guano to fertilize their fields. So you can immediately see how uh, they can infect themselves with some viruses. Uh, that does it for lecture one. Next time we're going to talk about the infectious cycle. We're going to see what viruses, what happens when a virus gets into a cell, what are the different uh, things that we can distinguish? Thank you.